in this country. We've been dealing with other things today. Far too many young couples find it hard to own their own homes. On the things that matter to people. is irresponsible and it's wrong and they should... We have to make sure that we focus jobs and living standards and the National Health Service and schools. People worry about disrespect on the street. I've always believed... The British people... Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome. This is uh, this was actually unscheduled, um, but I saw this came up earlier on. Uh, we had to uh, push the Francis Bacon deepest law, and so I thought, well, I'll do this instead. Um, I pushed it to this slightly later time because I was hoping to be able to download the the video, um, but. Uh, uh, for some whatever reason, I cannot download it, so we're going to have to watch it straight from YouTube. Um, which, considering the state of my internet, which is the reason why we had to push the, the bacon stream, um, may prove to be an issue, but hopefully it won't be. Um, let me just get set up here. So, so basically, earlier on today at Chatham House, which is one of the um, kind of important elite meeting places, uh, Tone took part in a private public partnership type uh, roundtable with um, the, uh, the president of the British Chamber of Commerce, Baroness Martha Lane Fox, and the president and vice chair of Microsoft, Brad Smith, and the event um, was actually co-hosted by the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change in partnership with Microsoft. So these are the sorts of people that Tone likes to hang out with. And here on this channel, we have a little look at what he's up to. Just before we get going, I will... Um, I will... Um, <clears throat> I will... Um, the uh just remind people do uh, take my uh courses at the academic academic agency i'm actually into the foundations of economics ad at the moment but given that we're focusing on tone i'll remind you that as well as the trivium uh, foundations of entrepreneurship and foundations of economics uh one of the kind of lesser known uh courses at the academic agency that you can take which is uh, which was actually the populist illusion was written. It's pretty much the course book for foundations of politics, um, and I'll just play you the foundations of politics ad because it's uh, much forgotten about. Foundations of politics only three hundred and fifty pounds. Buy it now. See the world as it is and not how it ought to be. History is the graveyard of aristocracy. Who says organization says oligarchy? Who decides? Who interprets? The extremes of individualism and socialism meet. That was their predestined course. Foundations of politics. Only £350. Buy it now. All right, and uh, the other thing I wanted to look at just briefly before we we have a look at this uh, this stream that uh, happened later, earlier on at Chatham House is this paper I found uh, of, of much interest to to us here, uh, which is the uh, it was it's a Russian paper came out of Moscow State University and uh, the Russian Federation a couple of years ago, and it's called uh, tracking. Tracking changes the, to the stylistic behaviour of Tony Blair as Prime Minister and former Prime Minister. Very interesting, hey? Um, and basically, I'll just read you the, the abstract and we'll have a little look at... Uh, I'll put it up uh, if you'd like, uh, make it a bit uh, bigger here. And um, I'll just read you what it says. It says, this article features the communicative behaviour of Tony Blair in his premier and post-premier years. It put forwards and corroborates the hypothesis that about two years after his landslide victory and parliamentary election, Blair switched his strategy, and this basically um, uh, kind of backs up what I've been saying, that he changed his 
he changed up his game after coming into power in 97. I think he, he realised that he'd made some mistakes in those first couple of years because he was young and naive. Um, they have a bit more of a cynical take, uh, as you'll see. But there's definitely a change that happens early on uh, in New Labour. Uh, they say Blair switched his strategy from that of an ardent reformer and a pacifist to a hawk, an opportunist and a conformist and stuck to it to the end of his legislatures. The charges against Blair in 2016 on the nation's involvement in the Iraqi military campaign in 2003 caused him to change his stylistic behaviour. Special emphasis is laid on how Blair had long exploited a series of communicative tactics with the intent to manipulate mass consciousness. These include epithets, syntactic repetitions and rhetorical questions. And you can learn all about them if you do Foundations of Rhetoric, of course, because uh, there is a bit on Blair there, but I also go through a lot of different rhetorical tactics uh, sourced from ancient Greece and elsewhere. Um, Blair's selected discourses in 2003, when he was campaigning for Britain's military involvement in Iraq, and in 2016, when he was trying to justify his actions in court, revealed deception markers, specifically a distribution of I-we pronouns in text, which point to Blair's evasion strategy. A meaningful part of Blair's manipulative strategy was to create and sustain several political myths, including appeal for unity, creation of the evil opposition, and appeal to democratic countries as a legitimate source of power. These were drawn on ungrounded and unverifiable statements. Now, I must point out, of course, this paper is coming from Russia. So it is actually coming from, you know, quote unquote, an enemy camp. But still very interesting. I think you'd agree. Um, I won't read all, all of this, but we will go to some bits that uh, I thought were of interest here. Uh, I'll just read the intro because, you know, they, they pick up on several interesting things and maybe we'll look out for these uh, in this forthcoming uh, stream on Chatham House, which we're going to watch. It says, this paper attempts to provide new insights into the language profile of Tony Blair, UK Prime Minister, who launched a new uh, Labour policy, questioned the essence of monarchy and evolved Britain in a military conflict in Iraq. Special emphasis is laid on the contrastive analysis of Tony Blair's premier and post-premier rhetoric. And this is the other reason that this was quite interesting to, to me and to us, because, you know, typically on this channel, we focused on Dark Lord, so-called Dark Lord Blair, that is post-premier, global, kind of Svengali networker Blair, rather than Blair as PM. And this paper actually draws attention to some of the differences between Blair in power and Blair, quote unquote, out of power, or or we could say ascended Blair, you know, Blair above power. Um, with the attempt to entrack and uh, trace the changing stylistic behaviour and manipulative discourse of the ex-premier, the recent investigation into Blair's, uh, into British involvement in the Iraqi military campaign again makes Blair's rhetoric uh, a research object showing that a politician in power and a politician out of office may differ substantially. The speeches under analysis are the general election victory speech of May the 2nd, 1997, the famous uh, speech on the death of Princess Diana, um, uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, on the 31st of August, one of Blair's most famous uh, speeches. And do you remember what we were talking about before? Shape the grief, shaping the grief, uh, the princess of our hearts. You know, it was a bit of a rhetorical masterstroke. Bear with me one second. I'm just going to grab my phone here so I can see the chat. Hold on. Uh, the general election victory speech, June 2001. Um, on the September 11 attacks in 2001, the... Speech at the Labour Party convention, two thousand two. No, we're not going to read all this paper, but this is what this is basically what they're what they're looking at. Um, so uh, I'm just making sure. Uh, 
just making sure that people can hear what I'm saying here. Press 1 if you can hear me. I can now see the chat. Hopefully people can hear me. Yeah. Um, uh, then they analyze parts of Blair's memoirs, A Journey, 2010, something we're going to look at during the Summer of Tone, uh, dedicated to the Iraq War, Kosovo, and 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. A special interest are speeches made after resignation all related to foreign and domestic issues, for example, Brexit. Tony Blair's statement in response to the Iraq War inquiry in 2016, Tony Blair's speech on blocking Brexit in 2017, and remarks by Tony Blair on receiving the Lincoln Leadership Award in 2018. Contrastive analysis of a politician's primary and post period years is a relatively new subject, and then they, 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 they carry on. Um, so, let's have a look. On the origins of Blair's rhetoric, I, I just think this is a fascinating paper. And I thought well, this is as good time as any to 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 have a look. Um, uh, he says, um, I'm going to skip all the preamble here. Um, Charterist Black claims that Blair picked up some of Thatcher's behavior models and methods of convincing and attracting the people. He argues that Blair realized how successfully she had developed a personality cult based on certainty and aggression. This is something that ultimately his rhetoric sought to emulate. We cannot say for sure that Blair imitated Thatcher. It would take some time to explore the question. He just understood the key to her success and used it to earn admiration, mixing it with his own strong artist skills and education. Blair's confidence, supported by his smooth and grammatically correct speech, made him sound believable and win people's hearts including mine, of course, famously back in 2001 when I voted. The first time I ever voted, I voted for Tony Blair. One of the main strategies of Blair's rhetoric was creating the image of a righteous hero. Interestingly, it was not a fully original idea. Blair admires Margaret Thatcher a lot. He would ask her for advice and adopted some of her rhetorical patterns and ideas. Both uh, believed that Great Britain was a unique, powerful country with a long and rich history which of course it is, and it was literally their mission to save it, to save Britain in this new world. They wanted back the ancient glorious past of Britain, and both agreed that America would play an important role to achieve this aim. This idea developed due to Blair's religious views, among other factors. As he aged, Charteris Black says, Blair dropped the meek and diffident manner of his youth to become a preacher politician, employing what can be described as conviction rhetoric. This is all very interesting to me. Should be interesting to you as well. Blair tried to act as if he was a saviour of the innocent and deprived. He started his leadership defending the rights of the poor and the needy. He used metaphors from the domains of good and evil. He implied that he was and is an ethical man who appealed to others who share these values. Apart from saving Great Britain and the innocent and deprived, Blair tried to act as a missionary, persuading America and the EU to accept Vladimir Putin and Russia. Such actions were not a novelty as Thatcher did just the same by accepting Gorbachev. Due to their approaches, some European countries began to maintain closer relationships with Russia. And this is actually something that Blair has come under fire for in recent years, his closeness to Putin uh, in the early 2000s. P Blair really wanted to bring Putin in uh, during, during his premiership. However, later, Blair used it for something bigger. The Iraq War was Blair's opportunity to act like a superhero. In his speeches, he was creating an image of innocent Iraqis who desperately needed help from powerful democratic countries, meaning the United Kingdom and, of course, the USA. He did his best to convince his people that the UK's interference in the Iraq War was essential for saving the needy. Regrettably, the... Uh, I'll just... Uh, update this but for some reason on my phone the chat gets um chat gets uh, kind of 
messed up these days. But anyway, I'll, I'll carry on. He did his best to convince his people that the UK's interference in the Iraq war was essential for saving the needy. Regrettably, the more British lives were lost, the more committed Blair was to an ethical position, and the more pronounced was his rhetorical style. Moreover, Charteris Black justly notes that Blair manages to sound earnest due to the occasional hesitancy and informality. His speech was clear, simple and free of redundancies. To reiterate, there were a lot of things in common between Blair and Thatcher. Both politicians were excellent orators. However, Blair had one thing that made him unique. He possessed natural charm and charisma that captivated the people. Blair knew exactly what the masses wanted him to say. And this is, of course, what make, makes Blair simultaneously kind of captivating, as they say, but also quite a dangerous figure because he, he is so good at making people think that he's on their side. Um, and, uh, you know, something to remain vigilant uh, about, of course, um, but, but also for other reasons, as I talked about. I, I do actually think that the Blairite faction are the ones who are best equipped to put the far left away in this country. They are the people who hate the far left in this country, uh, partly because the far left were always onto him and onto them. Um, and they see them as bitter enemies uh, in a way that the Tories don't. Uh, the Tories always pander to the left. Blair always fights the left. So that's one of the one of the reasons why I have my kind of rather comp rather kind of uh, real politic uh, position on Blair uh, these days. Uh, however, I would never, uh, I would never doubt that he has kind of dark, dark powers. Uh, I mean, we, you know, I coined the phrase the Dark Lord for exactly this reason. Um, Blair's success can be attributed to the fact that he was able to remodel the Labour Party rhetoric, adopting many elements of the free market orientated conservatives seen under the government of Margaret Thatcher. And this is something that Blair did a lot, actually, during during the, the time when he was the prime minister. He tried to out Thatcher Thatcher. He tried to move like he tried to be more market than the Tories, it, 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 whether it's on economics or on social issues. The classic Blair manoeuvre is always strafe right, strafe right, strafe right, because he has he has a he has an honest belief that left wing policies are unpopular in in Britain. So so he believes that the way to win over the working class and to win over most of the country is essentially by being a right wing. Um, anyway, uh, and and of course the real thing he's got his eye on is power always. Um, anyway, leaving behind the old ret rhetoric positions of the Labour Party that were considered to be out of date, Blair introduced a new rhetorical theme that came to define his government in the new Labour project. Blair repeatedly showed his outstanding ability to analyse and use the obtained information. He realised that it was time for British politicians to merge the official style of their rhetoric with speaking English. This new style of communication was in direct contrast to that of the Labour opposition during the period of Margaret Thatcher's domination. In the old Labour discourse, there was a divergence between the discourse of party politics and the discourse of ordinary people. New Labour responded to the developments in American political discourse. And what they're really getting at there is that if you go back to a lot of those old Labour politicians, Michael Foote being the classic example, but there are many other examples. They, they had a kind of dusty and Marxist quality to them. They came across like kind of left wing professors in a way. And they, you know, they spoke in the language of like class struggle and things like this. And, and Blair knew that that sort of stuff just didn't land. That was the kind of that was academic language. It was theoretical and that didn't connect with ordinary people. And I, I do think that this is an aspect of New Labour. As we continue with the with the summer of tone, when we look at the 1997 election and so on, it wasn't just Blair, but his entire crew, who we, who we looked at uh, on Monday, they were very good at speaking plain English, just just stating things 
in a way that you grasp what they're saying immediately. They're also extremely good at message discipline and slogans and things like that. Um, just good at propaganda, I guess you'd say. They were just good at it. Um, Blair shifted from uh, the formal style to informal style quite naturally, frequently using the first person singular. And this is something else that uh, Tone was noted for. Um, you, know, you know, famously, he'd take his tie off and he'd, he'd, he wouldn't wear a tie. That's, that's, the, that's the Blair look. A bit more informal. He appeared on talk shows on the sofa, for example, so it wasn't quite so buttoned up. He made the establishment seem less stuffy in a way. And this appealed to people, um, obviously, in the three elections that he won. Um, um, he expressed his own feelings and used some common expressions to sound intimate and trustworthy. You know, there was an element of Blair which is like, hey, listen, guys, I'm, I'm just like you in a way, you know. I mean, obviously, Blair is well spoken. But he was able to speak to the kind of middle part of the country. And then, like I talked about last time, he had all these old working class bruisers who like Prescott and uh, Alan Johnson and so on, who could just speak blunt and they were northern guys and they could speak to the, you know, to the Labour heartlands. But between them, they spoke to the whole country um, by convincing everybody that they were just like you. And a big part of this that people forget about, uh, by the way, is the fact that Blair was young and he had a family. Do you remember, there were, he had like three kids, I think, at the time when he was the Prime Minister. So his household really did look like a normal family. Like he had kids in number 10 and things like that. So he kind of presented himself almost like a kind of working dad, just like you, you know. Um, and th this is something I think it's easy to roll your eyes at now, looking back. But it was a huge part of his success, and also something that I think politicians have, have lost, uh, by and large, since uh, the early 2000s. You know, David Cameron's David Cameron tried to do the Blair thing, but I, th I always think that the country, even though Blair, uh, Cameron did technically win two elections, what well, he kind of, he had a hung parliament in 2010, and they had the, uh, the Lib Dem Tory coalition, but he did win in 2015. But I think Cameron always had a problem seeming like he was human. He seemed like he was trying to be Tony Blair as opposed to authentically being the thing itself. Uh, and Cameron was is a lot posher than Blair is. He, he's, he's an Eton boy. But Blair is, is quite posh, but he's not as he's not as kind of identifiably upper crust as somebody like David Cameron is. Um, so, I mean... There are other people who are able, like Boris, I would say, is really good at connecting with people. Boris does it by leaning into his poshness a bit, like he. But that's authentic. Whereas Cameron always had that kind of um, hint of authenticity to him, and he was a bit robot-like, and people didn't like that. And um, he also didn't surround himself with people who could connect with the working class like Blair did. Um, George Osborne would be the, the banner example. I always remember George Osborne appeared at a football ground and was roundly, roundly booed. Like in the stadium, he, everybody booed him. That, that that sort of thing just wouldn't have happened under, under New Labour when, when Blair was in. Uh, anyway, um, researchers... Uh, um, uh, yeah, by speaking the same language as the electorate, Blair reduces the rhetorical distance between himself and the mass audience he aims to reach. Researchers claim that Blair's premiership rhetoric was extremely emotional, even passionate. Aristotle, in his rhetoric, states that emotional speeches are the most convincing and sincere. Apparently, Blair knew Aristotle's works and applied that knowledge to its full extent. Reporters consistently wrote about Blair's manner of making speeches, notably his gestures and rising and falling intonation contours. This created the impression of sincerity. It was important not only what Blair said, but how he said it too. Blair seems to have understood the importance of pathos in rhetoric. And these are all things you can learn on Foundations of Rhetoric. This isn't like meant to be one long <laughs> advert for Foundations of Rhetoric, but 
if you're unfamiliar with some of these terms, I do go through them in detail on that course. The emotional tone of the speech was undoubtedly important, otherwise reporters would hardly have paid attention to it. Hamilton also points out that Blair tends to use dialogic models in his speech. In the dialogic model, claims are met by counterclaims, thereby giving the impression that rational argument means moving from one position to another until a final position is reached, and the action of making claims and counterclaims end. And this is something else that uh, you don't see politicians do that, that much these days. Blair has this way of anticipating what your objections to his position might be and it's very disarming because he then states what your objection might be and in fact on foundations of rhetoric i look at an example of him doing this with abortion as an issue for example he states the anti-abortion case perfectly um in the, in the example i look at and even more than that he sympathizes with it he says oh i understand and i appreciate where you're coming from very clever because he then disarms the opponent and says, oh, well, this guy is not like my enemy. He understands where I'm coming from. And, and then he, you know, makes a few, you know, pro-abortion points and ends up coming to the, you know, the so-called sensible centrist position, which is, you know, basically, you, you know, you, you should have abortions up to the up to the second trimester or something or whatever it happened to be. Um but he did it in a way that doesn't, you know, demonize his opponent, which, again, is something that the left these days aren't very good at. The, the, you know, now, if you're against abortion in any single way, the left will basically call you evil. So he was very, very clever at that. Um, OK, so I will I will just um, uh, skip over this uh, bit here. It goes through what Blair was like in his first ministry um and you know you can see all the various different analyses really really interesting stuff uh in my view worth kind of reading through um i was just like i haven't come across this this kind of in-depth analysis of political rhetoric like this so just just really good Re really really interesting um but basically they you know they're they argue that over time, Blair becomes more kind of pre more of a kind of preach, pre preacher politician and more of a conviction politician, especially um, uh, over this period here. He says the 2001 victory speech at first glance seems no different from the 1997 speech. The same notions of changes and future and family values and the importance of children. When was the last time you saw a left-wing politician now talk about family values, by the way. Um, but changes, now used six times in this speech against only one occurrence in 1997, are now associated with difficulties. The changes will not be easy to overcome the challenge of change. He also said, I have learned three times in the same paragraph, as if to convince people that the first term of being Prime Minister had taught Blair something. I don't actually think he's lying about that. He's always been consistent on the fact that he was naive in 1997. He's, al he's always maintained that whenever I've seen him. And he and his government had made some improvements. Improvements. I have improved it. In this speech, he primarily uses the personal pronoun I and not we. And this is allegedly to suggest that Blair is taking the blame for the mistakes of the first term. He sounds apologetic and yet hopeful. Some themes from 1997 remained. But, for example, the concept of Britain as a unique nation with unique people. Britain is a very special country, and its people are very special people, says Blair. However, Blair now sounds like a globalist. The healthy nationalism is gone. He puts forward the idea of keeping up with the rest of the progressive world. In respect of Europe and the wider world, we need to make changes so that we are engaged, exerting influence, having the self-belief not to turn our back on the world, to retreat into isolation, says Blair. Out of the blue arises the reform of the criminal system. Although there are no direct references to war and military actions, one cannot notice the shift in agenda. What I might do, given that this paper is so interesting, and I don't want to spend the whole the whole stream, I just wanted to kind of introduce it. I might uh, I might actually write a piece 
on this on my Substack because I just think it's really fascinating that it exists at all. So anyway, without further ado, let us shift courses now and have a look at um, if we can see some of this stuff that they were talking about in his appearance earlier today in partnership with Microsoft uh, talking about global AI governance and what is the UK's role. Now this is uh, particularly interesting because it's something that Rishi Sunak has been talking about recently and obviously Blair regardless of who's in power, is going to want to backseat drive. He's going to want to backseat drive what's going on. And look, look, he's right in there with Microsoft steering the conversation in Chatham House, probably one of the most influential places in the world. So let us uh, now make a start. Um, there may be some streaming difficulties. It may be choppy because my internet's not very good at the moment. Uh, I apologise in advance if it's choppy. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, let's just get to the start. Here we people go. People joining us online. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome you to this session on global AI governance. What is the UK role? And we are going to be talking about the UK, but the questions go much, much wider. I'm Bronwyn Maddox, the director, if we haven't met. And I can't think, seriously, of a better trio of people, I'm not even going to call you a panel, um, to come to assemble to talk about... Gorgeous shiny suit from town today. Gorgeous shiny suit. <laughs> ...about these things today. We're doing this in partnership with... Can I, can I just say that globalists love these kind of women with deep voices. They love a woman with a deep voice. I don't know why that is. Uh, anyway, they're always knocking around these sorts of... Uh, conversations. Microsoft and the Tony Blair Institute and very glad to have worked with them both on this event and with Microsoft on many questions of research and convening ahead of the UK's summit that the Prime Minister has called to discuss AI and governance later this year in the, in the, in the autumn. So thank you very much indeed for that. Um, before I introduce the, uh, the, the, the trio, we're just going to have a short video from Chloe Smith, the Secretary of State for Digital, Sci uh, sorry, Department for Science, Innovation and Technology, the new formulations of this uh, Whitehall machinery always um, uh, catch me out. Um, and she's going to speak to us for a few minutes, particularly about the plans that the government has for that summit. And then we're going into our discussion. So if we can have that video now. Good afternoon and a warm welcome to everyone attending today's discussion on global AI governance. My thanks to Brad Smith and the Microsoft team, the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. And I just want to mention, by the way, this is a Tory minister. This is a member of the current government. Yet, from the tone of this, you wouldn't know that Blair was Labour and she was Tory and that these people weren't all on the same side. They're all clearly part of the same set. Um, this is kind of James Burnham managerialism 101. Uh, it's just kind of interesting to note that there's no... She thanks Blair, Blair Institute, she thanks Microsoft. These are all clearly members of the same club, the same elite, and they speak the same language and they, they move in the same circles. Um, this is one reason why um outsiders like trump and various other figures populist figures that we've seen find it difficult to get anything done because they're not part of this set they don't move in this crowd they're not a member of the ruling class in this way um and uh that that is i think i think a problem um because if Unless you're going to get a complete clear them out overthrow of the system, the only way you're going to get anything done within the system is actually through these sorts of people because they're the ones who actually have power and actually make things happen. So let's carry on. And Chatham House for holding these valuable discussions in the run-up to the UK's hosting of the Global AI Safety Summit. The questions to which we're seeking answers... It's not Thatcher in the background, it's the Queen. <laughs> you mong, it's the fucking Queen. <laughs> <laughs> today about how we govern and regulate AI could not be more pertinent nor more pressing. 
Artificial intelligence is no longer the stuff of science fiction. It's here in our pockets, our cars, our offices, our hospitals and our homes. I'll just mention, for example, that my analysis is going to be political. I cannot speak to the technology side of AI. I do know a lot of science bros and computer engineering guys and so on maintain that AI doesn't exist. But for the purposes of the political discourse, it does. And that's the thing that actually matters, is that there's the perception that it does exist, regardless of what the technic technicalities are. This, so we're having this conversation because the ruling class believes that AI is a thing, uh, as does the president of Microsoft, Blair, and this woman from the government. So, And that is really the thing that if these guys say AI exists, regardless of what the technicalities are, it does basically exist and will become part of the kind of um, discursive reality and the legal reality uh, for all of us. So that's why it's really important to separate the political discourse from the technical, correct, correct technical uh, detail. Its adoption is arguably no less significant than the groundbreaking inventions of the battery, the microchip or the World Wide Web. AI is fast becoming part of our daily lives and will continue to become even more integral to our economy and our society as this technology rapidly advances. The government has long recognised its transformative potential and we've sought to be ahead of the curve. That's evidenced in the £2.5 billion we've invested since 2014 in building a thriving AI ecosystem and the AI sector deal that we announced all the way back in 2018, which we backed up with the national AI strategy three years later. I think it's worth mentioning here that this is the Rishi Sunak government doing this and also previously uh, the Boris administration and the Theresa May administration, we, we, right? Now, Blair is there and we know that Blair is directly advising Keir Starmer, who's very probably going to be the next prime minister. And notice, by the way, that that there's going to be continuity on this, regardless of who's in power. And this is one of those one of those things that is worth bearing in mind because, um, <clears throat> I mean, we all know democracy is kind of a kind of a sham, and there's a uniparty and so on and so forth. But the reality is is that a country like Britain and a country like America and any country in the world has to have continuity between its various between its various parties, otherwise it wouldn't be able to function. This is why there is a permanent managerial ruling class to ensure that these projects that they're talking about don't suddenly get nixed by some guy who come who's elected. They can't have the people wrecking their plans, right? They can't, so whatever's hap whatever this these AI plans are that Sunak and Co are announcing here will be continued in some shape or form by New Labour 2.0. And from one point of view, that's bad because it's not democratic. But from another point of view, it's actually necessary. How are you, how are you going to get um, any sort of competitive um, uh, position with a nation like China or Russia who don't have to worry about these sorts of things? China announced five-year and 10-year and 20-year plans and enacted them. And there's continuity from one, you know, from... Um, one uh, uh, kind of premiere to the next because it's all the, the Communist Party in that country. So it's a basic reality for any country that you need to be able to have a long, a, a long planning horizon. And democracy, as we all know, is a, is a, is a detriment when it comes to long term planning. So I mean, I, I do. I'm not going to say I sympathise, but I understand from a from a value-free point of view why it is that all these people have to be part of the same set. Like, the, the country can't function otherwise. You know, imagine um, Corbyn's Labour got in and they, they were like, oh no, fuck all that, we're going to change all of the plans that the last government announced. It'd be chaos. So th there has to be some level of continuity from one ruling party to the next ruling party, uh, as as a matter as a matter of uh, pragmatic reality. 
Fast forward to the here and now, and the UK is at the very forefront of AI, not just in its application, but in its governance as well. The Prime Minister couldn't have been clearer when he set out our national ambitions on artificial... It's not that I'm, adv it's not that I'm admiring the CCP. I'm just saying that any ruling class has to be able to plan over a period of 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. They have to be able to think civilizationally and nationally, as well as just, oh, what should we do with the next election coming? How are we going to get reelected all the time? There has to be a long term strategic vision. And that's what and that's what these sorts of conversations are about. This is in a way, this sort of thing is more important than what people are saying in their election pledges and all of that sort of stuff. Because this is the stuff that will actually actually affect what happens in five years and ten years' time. And it's something that we should all be interested in. What, what are these guys planning when it comes to AI? It's something we've all talked about. Let's have a look. Artificial intelligence earlier this month. To lead at home. To lead abroad. To lead change in our public services. We're fulfilling those ambitions, starting with our AI white paper. It shows how we intend to address AI's inherent risks, but also create a regulatory environment which fosters innovation and growth. It advocates a proportionate and agile approach, recognising the need for a regime that can keep pace with the rapid way in which AI is advancing. We recognise as well that when it comes to AI... I.e. we need to control this before it gets out of control. And again, from a completely value neutral point of view, if I was the government, if I was running this country, I would be looking seriously at what AI can do, what it's, you know, what are the threats that it poses and what rules we can put around it. It's actually sensible to want to regulate this now because, you know, some of the stuff we've seen already, I think, has been scary. You know, I even think about banning it. They're not saying that. They're saying they want to put a regulatory framework around it to, to at least control what it can do. So let's carry on. Governance. The government cannot and should not go it alone. That's one of the reasons why we've established the Foundation Model Task Force to drive UK capabilities so that we can be standard bearers for the safe development and deployment of AI. And I'm delighted that we recently announced Ian Hogarth as the chair of that Foundation Model Task Force. As an esteemed entrepreneur, investor and the co-author of the annual State of AI report, Ian brings a wealth of knowledge to the role. Under his stewardship, the task force will focus on navigating the complex challenges posed by Frontier AI, bringing together expertise from right across government, industry and academia. It will collaborate closely with leading tech AI companies like Google DeepMind, OpenAI and Anthropic, who've agreed to share access to their models for safety research. We've said all along that this has to be an international effort, and it's one that we're proud to lead. By the way, speaking of rhetorical skills and connecting with the people, this woman could almost be AI, couldn't she? She's not exactly charismatic, but that's probably why she's a minor cabinet minister and not, uh, <laughs> and not anybody you've heard of. We've been engaging with international bodies, including the Chancellor of Europe, the G7 and the Global Partnership for AI and the OECD. And we've committed to working hand in hand with our partners in the US through the Atlantic Declaration that the Prime Minister recently agreed with President Biden. As I mentioned earlier, the UK has also committed to holding the first major global summit on AI safety this autumn, assembling partners from across the globe to consider the risks of AI, including frontier systems. And I, sh I should mention that this conversation here that Microsoft and the Blair Institute are putting on are basically discussing what should that AI summit look like. So that AI summit that's going to happen in August is really important when it comes to this topic. And what Blair always does is he gets in beforehand to shape the entire discourse beforehand. So this is basically a conversation about what everybody else is going to be talking about in a couple of months time and this in a way this this one may be more important than that one because they're basically setting the parameters of the later discussion 
so that we can overcome these challenges together. The summit will consider AI risks and discuss how they can be mitigated through internationally coordinated action. That will help to ensure that AI develops and is applied safely, not just here, but around the world. That its benefits are fully realised tomorrow because of the guardrails we put in place today. By effectively addressing the risks, we can seize the many opportunities that AI has to offer. From transforming our NHS with the discovery of new drugs, new treatments and new ways of supporting patients, to helping us race ahead to net zero and build a greener, fairer, more efficient economy. In that sense, the conversation on AI is not just a technical one. It's a social one, a cultural one. It asks us to reconsider our relationship with technology and to imagine the kind of future we want to build with it. But we can only do that by working together. Indeed, Tony Blair's and William Hague's comprehensive report, A New National Purpose, is compelling in the way it sets out the true promise of this technology and the need for the UK to remain at the forefront of the AI revolution. We're listening to some of the most valued voices in tech, like Baroness Lane Fox, who knows from first-hand experience how businesses can use technology to innovate, grow and rapidly expand. And we're working with our partners in academia and in world-renowned think tanks like Chatham House to ensure that the views of leading experts and thinkers on AI are placed at the heart of this debate. <laughs> no, at no, no point do they say, and we might consult the, pu the public to see what they think. No, it is completely in the hands of a, manager a permanent managerial elite. By the way, Blair co-wrote the paper with Haig, who is a Tory. This is a Tory woman. You wouldn't know it because they're all part of the same set. It's, it's, it, I, I find it fascinating just how closed off this conversation is. They include academia. They include industry experts. They include both of the political parties. But the public, the people who will actually be affected by this, are almost entirely shut out of the com They're not even part of the conversation. They're not even a consideration. And neither should they be. Michelle Donnellan and I want all of you to be part of this journey because together we can ensure that artificial intelligence helps us realise not just a more prosperous, more dynamic economy, but a stronger country and ultimately a better world. Thank you. Oh, God. For playing that. Thank you very much, Chloe Smith, for giving it. I can't fire questions at her. So we're going to go straight into this discussion. Well, let me briefly. I reckon she'll fire a quick email, though, you know, fancy a drink later, Chloe. Because, you know, we, 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 we both like a bit of the rug, don't we? <laughs> introduce, though they need very little introduction, Brad Smith, president of Microsoft, who uh, I think you said it was the 18th country where you're bringing some of the, uh, these themes, but has uh, written and spoken very widely for Microsoft and for the industry about these questions. And you may have come across his book, Tools and Weapons on the Promises and Threats um, of uh, the Digital Age and indeed the podcast of the same name. Tony Blair, former Prime Minister, also of the Tony Blair Institute, and I'm really struck at how Tony Blair and the Institute, which has dedicated itself to governance and leadership, has seized this subject and been right out in the front. This is the thing that continually fascinates me. She said, oh, they've seized this subject. There's, there is not a subject they haven't seized. It doesn't matter what the policy area is. It could be roads. It could be taxes. It could be they're already there. It, it's, 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 it kind of blows my mind how many different issues they're across. They're all kind of omnipresent. It, 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 it's kind of, it really is uh, quite, quite something. On it. And Martha Lane Fox, uh, uh, a peer, President of the British Chamber of Commerce, a leading figure in the UK and international tech industry. And also, we were discussing earlier uh, other things, um, not only uh, former director of, of, of Twitter, but Chancellor of the Open University and co founder and chair of Lucky Voice, which has revolutionized the karaoke industry. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not going there today. We're starting on these bigger and more serious, anyway, questions. Thank you all very, very much for coming here. Let me, let me start um, with you all of just saying, um, if you can give us 
What was the hardest thing? Your, your, your calibration of how big this challenge is. We've had these extraordinary uh, statements, um, all the more striking for coming from people who lead technology companies of warning apocalyptically about the threats to the human race uh, and about the ways that uh, technology may now run ahead um, and seeming, you know, if, 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 if you like, without limit on the threat side and people also pouring words and words uh, to my mind, most movingly and excitedly, actually, at the moment, in some of the pharmaceutical and medical diagnostics industry, about about the potential. Can you, can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine being moved by papers that come out of Big Pharma? That's basically what you just said. Oh, she's moved by <laughs> discourse coming out of Big Pharma. Jesus Christ! Potential. How do you see it in its significance, Brad? We've often had this conversation, a few of us inside Microsoft, what invention do we compare this to that seems the most apt? And I think the one that I've come to, others uh, as well, I think is the printing press. It was perfected by Gutenberg in 1452, and it fundamentally changed the humanity's ability to write, to create, to share knowledge, and wreak havoc, and bring good as people were able to I just want people to remind to be reminded, by the way, of my octopus model. Do you remember the octopus model where I said that it goes from the chest over to the network? This is the network on the octopus. If you remember, the network had corporations like Microsoft. It had NGOs, and it had an and it had an intersection through to government. Contra Curtis Yarvin, who puts academia at the top, it's very obvious to me that the discourse comes from these guys and filters down to academia, who then post hoc rationalize the stuff that these guys are saying, rather than vice versa. Yarvin believes the discourse is set by Harvard and Yale. I think the opposite. I think that it's these guys who set, the, who basically set the tone, to make a pun. Um, and I think that this is an example of that in action, because these guys will say, listen, we need research done on this. Here's a grant, university, minion, go off and write us the paper that we need. And you, I've actually, I actually traced that in my original octopus speech, and this is another good example uh, of it. I just thought I'd make that note. Let's hear what the Microsoft dude has to say. To write and read more books. And I would just analogize briefly that in some ways, yep, it made England and Great Britain a, a global power because by the year 1500, the Netherlands and England were consuming more books than any other country in the world. And of course, it turned out that the fears of some also proved to be true. There was a concern in the Ottoman Empire, it's what led them to ban the printing press 20 years after it was invented, that the clerics would lose control of religion, that the rulers would lose control of their people, and the calligraphers would lose their jobs. And to some degree, Martin Luther proved that indeed with the power of the printing press, the clerics did lose control of religion, and the Holy Roman Empire proved that the rulers did then lose control of people and absolutely the calligraphers lost their jobs. So it now it, this is very interesting that he brings this up because obviously in this analogy, him and this ruling class that we're looking at are akin to the Ottoman Empire. They're not akin to Martin Luther. They're akin to the Ottoman Empire. And this is, this is very interesting. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued to know where this conversation goes now because they would be the ruling class under threat by this new technology. So, I mean, I don't know what they say in the rest of this uh, panel, but, you know, thinking strictly in power terms, they are going to want to say something like, well, clearly banning the printing press wasn't the way to go, as the Ottoman Empire showed. We want to basically gain control over this thing before it gains control over us, before it dislodges us. We don't want to be end up like the Ottoman Empire. It's basically what he was saying just now. It's profound. Almost everything that's good 
and everything that's bad about the world in which we live today could in some ways be taken back to that invention, this will do the same thing. Okay. Tony, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, first of all, by the way, thank you to Chatham House for having us here, and it's a great pleasure to be with, with Brad and, and with Martha, and you, you couldn't have two more expert people, and, you know, personally, I don't think we've had enough of experts, so I'm... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, Brad, that's, a, that's an in-joke for the British, uh, but... Um, <laughs> Um, typical tone, by the way, straight away. It's great to be back here at Chatham House. Mick Foley, cheap pop, putting over the two guys who he's with. Classic tone, puts everybody at ease. Uh, something he's always done in, in the rhetorical style. And a little bit of a joke, you know, ha ha, we, we love experts here. We are the, like the true globalist elite, unlike sick Michael Gove, who said he didn't like experts during the Brexit vote. That was the, what the reference was to, if you're not aware. And so I'm not going to talk so much, because uh, I'm not qualified to talk about some of the technical detail of this, but what I do want to say is that Brad used the analogy of the printing press. I used the analogy of the 19th century Industrial Revolution, but you can get the magnitude of, of that from these analogies of what we're talking about. I think this will change everything I have, what is this suit he's wearing it's almost like something that te the million dollar man ted dibiase would wear in the 80s this is a very very kind of uh, shiny suit that tone is wearing today but uh, anyway and the fascinating thing my institute actually once published a, a paper on this um, about three or four years back which is how long did it take the world of politics to catch up with reality in the industrial revolution and the answer is it took a long time. And in the end, when it did catch up, and things moved much faster today, but everything changed. I mean... I'll just mention something, by the way, because this is something that really interests me. We have said on the, on the so-called DR, the, about, we have stressed the importance of thinking in civilizational terms. OK, and it's very clear from both what Blair was talking about and what the Microsoft guy said, these guys are thinking in, in historical terms and they're thinking in kind of epoch, in a kind of e in an epochal way. This is very different to the way that your typical public facing politician, they, they don't talk in that way because they're always facing the next election, the next election. So, 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 it, so, so in a way, these guys are speaking to actually profound issues that do affect everybody um i i, f I find that interesting because that you know we can say they're evil and we don't agree with them and so on but at least they're thinking in a historical way about where we are in history and they're making an analogies to other points in history I mean, everything changed and the modern state was born out of it um modern political parties were also born out of it so I think this is we're, we're at the start of a revolutionary change and the essential thing is that we comprehend it and get our heads around it from the public policy point of view and you know sometimes when people particularly from my own political persuasion on the center left as it were you, you, you know they say well I don't know we've got so many difficulties we've got public spending pressures and high taxes and low growth and low productivity what's our how can we be ambitious? What's our mission in this world of, of turmoil? And I say, this is your mission. This is going to change everything. So how you understand, master, and harness this technology revolution will define the place of this country and the shape of the world. So get your heads around that and stop spending your time thinking about a little bit more on tax, a little bit less on tax, a little bit more on spending, a little bit less on spending. That is not what the future is going to be about. It's going to be about this, understanding it, and dealing with it, accessing its opportunities, and I'm an opportunity person on it, but mitigating its risks. Thank you very much indeed. Martha? We need to harness the power for ourselves. Well, sometimes I think the best thing is just to play with the stuff. 
right? And one of the things that I think has happened in the last year is that you are able to play with an AI interface in a way that you have never been able to mm. before. That's there's a really a, good you know, point. In yeah. the sector, there's lots of talk about AI or AI conferences. Every tech sector gig would have someone talking about AI, investors chucking their money into the sector. But what has happened, in my opinion, in the last six to 12 months is that you can, anybody can play with it. In fact, more than that, to um, build on what Tony said, I think it's a dereliction of duty not to play with it if you're in a leadership position. Because if you don't understand what's possible, then you're not going to be able to start to understand how to learn, what the right policy decisions make, what the right commercial decisions to make. But it can also show you just the challenge that we have um, sort of basing policy decisions on technology that right now is very patchy. No disrespect, Brad, but it's very patchy. And I'll give you two examples. So in 40 minutes, and this is not an MLF exaggeration, which I can be prone to, I managed to take all of the content that I had created in my lifetime that's out on the web and turn it into a podcast in my own voice. Might take slightly longer for these two, but for my limited catalog, it was about 40 minutes. And pretty good quality podcasts. Don't worry, I'm never going to release them. <laughs> but then, so I thought, wow, that's interesting, right? That's a completely different way of productivity for me as MLF. And then I was thinking, well, if I was starting a business now, what would that mean? I wouldn't have a customer service team. I probably wouldn't have a finance team. I wouldn't have a money of the operations. That completely shifts how you build things in the future. So I totally and completely agree with my other uh, part of the trio. The bit that I think we still have to remember is the quality of the data right now and where we're at in the life cycle, which does make the challenge. Just, you know, to be silly, I put in this morning, tell me a joke about Brad Smith, Martha Lane Fox, and Tony Blair. Well, it turns out there are no jokes about us three, so <laughs> that's not going. They were awful. I'm not even going to bother to repeat them. So I just poked it a bit more, because in my experience of playing with this stuff, if you keep poking it, then it gets a bit better. Um, and I said, well, just one common purpose. Well, obviously, the common purpose was they're all interested in tech, and they've all been tech leaders. And then I poked it a bit further, and I said, yeah, but what do they like doing when they're not in tech? And apparently, the common thing between us is we all like going to the beach. So, you know, the, the, robots, the, robots, the robots aren't taking over immediately, but I'm not diminishing, I'm not... Summer of tone, of course, on the beach. I'm not diminishing the importance of this moment. I'm just saying that we've, this has been happening for a long time. It's now that the scales have fallen off certain eyes because we have a much more direct interface into it, and we need to take it very seriously. I, I didn't know that about you, Brad. <laughs> I, didn't, I did not know that about myself. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been a hallucination. <laughs> or you are allowed to say it's wrong, and that, that, yes, that, that, exactly. that, 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 that is still part of it. All right, so it's, 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 it's big, and you've got a lot of um, eloquence and subtlety to the ways in which it is going to change things. What is the first thing that governments ought to do now? We've had the pitch from Chloe Smith and, and indeed from Rishi Sunak about what the UK government wants to do. We have the summit coming down. What is the most... Um, well, I'm, I'm going to stick with the first thing, which is not always the same as the most important thing. But what, where do governments start in this? Um, Tony, let me, let me start with you and then... Yeah, I think, I mean, we tried to set this out in the paper, but I think it's probably where government should start with how it organizes itself, uh, both to comprehend better what is happening and to start to work through some of the applications of this. Because, you see, I think it, 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 in the end, you do have to reimagine what the state looks like, what, how your public services function in a, in a really profound way. So I think... You know, the first thing is to make sure government's properly organised. And, you know, we suggest that... Is Blair trying to build Mecca Bentham? I hope. Imagine he actually builds Mecca Bentham. That would be amazing. Mechatone. Uh, he's got the blades out, so you know he's serious. What does he mean by they need to radically change the way they're, they're structured and function? Kind of radical. The whole series of things in the paper, which I think, you know, one thing just to pick out is... The, the foundation model task force that the government's establishing should report to the Prime Minister. I mean, this has got to be driven from the centre, understood by the centre. But I think then secondly, which is maybe where you were thinking we, we should get to is, well, then what do you do about the regulation part of this? And, you know, I think the government's ambition in, in trying to make us a, a, a leader in this field is a perfectly sensible am ambition. But I think to do it, we have to recognise um, two things. Number one, this technology is, and these guys will explain it far better, also changing very fast. And even those people inventing it aren't sure where its next iterations will go. And secondly, 
Britain's not going to be able to kind of come up with its own thing and just insulate itself, right? So we are going to have to have close cooperation and partnerships with other key players within this, including, of course, the US um, and, uh, and, and the EU. So it's going to be, you know, I think this, this is an ambition that the, the... Always his answer. Basically, everybody needs the same regulatory framework across Britain, the EU and USA. Always what he ultimately wants to do is to make the rule standard across the, across all the different countries so that I guess there's no escape from whatever regulatory framework he has in mind. The UK leads in this field is completely possible, but it's got to organise itself properly. And when it, it gets into this, what is going to be a very, very difficult field of regulation, it's got to keep a very open mind on it close relationship with those who are engaged in the technology, as Martha was saying to me earlier, make sure that civic society and outside voices are heard, but also to, to be aware of the fact we'll need to do this in cooperation with others. And Brad, that, that's others within the country as well as internationally, isn't it? We were talking upstairs just briefly before about um, what companies might want from governments in this. Yeah, and I think this f focus on organization first, I think, is really interesting. And it is one thing you see in, in governments which make perfect sense. It's not something that I would have thought of initially being in the private sector. You really do have to decide in each government how you're going to organize yourself to manage this. I think the same is true in companies. And you know, fundamentally, one path here is, and it's a point that, that you've, uh, you've made, start using it. Um, use it in part because to use it is to understand and it demystifies it. You start to identify the fundamental processes that can be improved, how you boost the productivity of people, how you just serve citizens or consumers or customers in a more effective way. But then it does help you identify the problems that you need to manage as well. And so you start to identify which, which, the risks. Which, which, which are what? I, I'd like to dig into this a, a bit because this all... Um it can sound very abstract, and I know for the, those wrestling with it in government at the moment, it does feel rather abstract. They know they want to do something, and they have three months to work out what before this summit. They, the, they, they would be helped by you. Well, the, the, the first thing I, I, I would say is, you know, for a number of years, people have been focused on what I will call applications that are powered by AI. And there's been a real almost consensus globally on the principles which point to the problems people need to make sure that they avoid. You don't want to have bias in the computer systems that are deciding who gets a loan or who gets an application approved. You know, so you have to worry about bias and discrimination. You have to protect privacy. You have to focus on cyber. When he said bias and discrimination, I wonder if he means it in the same way as us, that the AI has been tampered with to not be truly on the level, or does he mean it that the AI produces disparate disparate outcomes for different groups? Because, you know, that's a bit ambiguous for me. Uh, be interested to know what exactly he means by that. For security... Um, we need to ensure that this technology is inclusive, meaning it's broadly accessible, it's easy for people to use, it's uh, as easy for people with disabilities as without. You have to ensure that it, it's transparent, and I think above all, you actually have to ensure that these systems remain accountable to people, and the people who are using them, who are creating them, are accountable to the public. Now, where the debate has really changed since last 30th of November when ChatGPT was released is that in addition to these applications, people have realized, oh my gosh, there are these so-called frontier or foundational models that are so much more powerful and can do so many more things than we thought we would see in the year 2023. And this is where I think there's this fundamental connection with safety. And like other products that are normally, that are extraordinarily useful, but also potentially dangerous, like electricity, a commercial aircraft, a high-speed train, just to give three examples, you need to develop a safety approach. And it starts with, what do you want to test? Who's going to test it? How are they then going to 
measure. And but how is AI like a train or a plane? They can actually kill you. I mean, what can? How is AI going to do that? I'm I'm just I'm struggling with this whole conversation because I it's it's hard to know really what they're talking about. Um, anyway, let's carry on. And reduce the risks that may be associated with it. Do they have to get a license to deploy it? How do they monitor it after it gets deployed? And then the last thing I would say is everybody's so focused on these big models, like GPT-4, for example, that it's easy to forget that in some ways this is like the engine in a car. You know, you can't have a safe car if you have an unsafe engine, but there's a lot more to the car than the engine. And what really matters in practice is how the model is deployed for specific mm. uses. And so what we do with OpenAI, what we do for Microsoft, is we have a deployment safety board, and we look at the specific scenario. So safety in what way? I mean, what does he mean by safety in this context? I'm struggling to really understand what he's talking about. I think this is where the UK can go in really sponsoring a summit around safety. What the world needs to see emerge, in effect, is a new paradigm for how to manage the safety of this new technology. Martha, you're nodding, and I want to, you, you've started all kinds of businesses from Confuse.com way back uh, to, to others more recently. How does government do this in a way that actually gets the best out of things and encourages people to start new things, doesn't choke it all off? I was actually reflecting on uh, the journey that I had in creating the Government Digital Service and Gov.UK here in the UK, because Gov.UK was born out of some work I did, um, and I think that some of the lessons from that project are directly applicable to some of the ways I think you could work in this arena as well. You know, we worked directly for the Prime Minister. We had massive civil service support, exactly to Tony's point. You need to have those two pieces of authority to get anything done, in my experience. It was a hugely entrepreneurial enterprise, but we brought in a lot of people from the outside in order to create government services in a way that had never been done before. We put an actual citizen in a room with a person who was building the policy. We started with DVLA, something that wasn't going to be completely catastrophic for people if it didn't quite go right. But no one in government had before met the person that had been trying to renew their driving license through linking up along the chain. <laughs> now, I, I don't say that to make you laugh particularly, it was actually quite depressing, but the reason I mention it is because I think there are ways, to Brad's point, that the UK can become a kind of indicator of what these these cases might look like and to build some very specific examples to just have those minimum viable products in what public services and safe public services look like. You know, the thing in all of this that I think makes a large constituent of people very, very anxious is about the increasing inequalities that are going to be, in my opinion, inevitable out of this. Not only two-tier businesses, those that get it, those that don't. And I'm president of the British Chambers of Commerce, and it's one of the top issues that I hear again and again from our 100,000 members. What do I do? Or I'm using it amazingly, and I've taken out half my team, so one or the other, right? Or so that's one aspect of concern. But the other aspect of concern is for the communities of people that are continually screwed over by bad public services because of bad data. And there are hundreds of examples. Whether, you, know, you think about examples in the Netherlands, the child benefit scandal, which actually led to the resignation of the Dutch prime minister because the algorithm was based on bad data that meant that um, it was discriminatory against a whole bunch of community of users who were being told that they had been defrauding the system when they hadn't, through to, you know, can you imagine if Windrush had been based on an algorithm? It was pretty bad already. So I think it's incredibly important that the UK stakes out a role in this safety aspect. I think we've done a lot of... I mean, I would suggest the sensible thing to do would to be not to use the algo to do those sort of things. That's what I would say. Employ, employ people to do it so that you don't get, you know, systematic problems if the data is bad. You don't get data, bad outcomes. Why are they insisting on using this if it... If it if it's as catastrophic as she's just said, as she's just said, I hope I hope somebody will make, will maybe this woman will raise this point. The work actually in digital government in this country we can be proud of. People have copied gov.uk all over the world, but you need to bring outside people and clean up the data and do some actual um, use cases and show what some of the ways that we can change are, and that's a very tangible thing. It's fascinating. One of the things you're saying, it seems to me, is uh, the government should use this, not yes. not, not not just regulate it, but use it itself. Yes. And move fast to, uh, to you. But what I mean, given what she just said, the obvious question is to say, why should governments use this if it can lead to such terrible outcomes, like in the Dutch case? 
use it. Um, and another one is, I, th I think, picking up on what Brad was saying, to go into the different areas, saying, look, there's not one answer to regulation, but it's actually what you do about transport or about mm -hmm. education data, or you've, you've actually got to get start getting to grips with these, these, um, these particular subject areas, if you, if you like. Tony, what, what do you think the biggest threats are? And with that, some of the most urgent things that government needs to do to keep people safe? Well, I think it is urgent because, you know, as Brad was saying earlier, th th this, is a, this is a technology that obviously, because it's a general purpose technology, it can be used for good and it can be used for bad. So, I mean, there are risks that fall into the category of wrongdoing. I mean, you can, there can be a whole generation of bioweapons spawned as a result of this. There, uh, there can be interference in elections. You know, there are, I think you can identify categories of risk fairly easily. Then you've got to decide what you actually do about that. But then as, as, as Martha was just saying, we will want gov government will want business to be efficient. Business will have to employ this technology, but when it employs the technology, it will do so often by making redundant. Mm. Um, some of its workforce, potentially quite a lot of its workforce, potentially, as I understand it, as much in white collar industries as, as not. So this is a, you know. So they're talking about mass unemployment. Mass unemployment is what they're talking about as a potential risk. This, the, the, the social and political implications are, are, are going to be huge. And I think that, I mean, I think that the, the, the other thing that's really important, therefore, from my uh, experience of, of government and the, the trouble with, you know, the trouble with politics, as I always say to people, it's the, it's the one really important job in, 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 the, in the world where, where you put people in place with absolutely no qualifications to do it. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> it's a sort of fascinating thing because the skill set that takes you to government mm -hmm. Is not a skill set that really helps you in governing, mm -hmm. and you know the <laughs> fact is. <laughs> Can I be really clear? Are you talking about politicians or civil servants? No, I'm talking about politicians. There the politicians go. who, because when you're when you're winning power, you're the great campaigner. You're the great. It's presentational skills. When you're in government, you actually become the chief executive, and it's a different skill set. And and you know I, we work with governments around the world in our, our institute and. You know, I always say to the leaders, you're in a completely different situation now you've come into power. It's a very good point. I mean, and we see it so often. Boris, great on the campaign, terrible in government. Trump, great in the campaign, terrible in government. Um, and Tony has said many times he learnt on the job because it is two completely different jobs. He's right, he's right about that. It's, it's all about... You know, focus, it's about strategy, it's about getting the right team in place, it's about prioritization, and above all, it's about getting the right policy and understanding the way the world's changing. Politics often doesn't work like that. You know, as I say to people, you start in politics, well, this is my experience anyway, you're least capable and most popular, and then you end, you know. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but the, you know, so by the time you actually get to know how to do the job, they want you gone. But there it is. So the thing is, you, you've got to, you, you, the, the most important thing in this is that the nature of the dialogue between government and not just the people in the sector, but outside has got to be so much richer and more deep. And, and you know, it's, it's all about understanding. Because if you don't understand it in the right way, you will definitely, I mean, I talk to politicians about this the whole time. And, the trouble is the default position for a politician is they get regulation. You know, that they get. They always get that. But what will be really difficult for them is to get the reimagining part of this. And that is where you've got to have the conversation with the people who are going to be, you know, owning and implementing a lot of this technology and the people who are going to be the potential beneficiaries or victims of it. And it requires, as I say, it requires a quite different sort of dialogue between the state and the citizen. Mm. Martha, um, Tony mentioned in the middle of that the disinformation point, and you were talking right at the beginning about your own ability to create your own um, podcast from all your past. What do you think everyone 
that including companies and governments ought to do about this because the capacity of these systems to mimic reproduce even do you call it mimicry it's a new creation that is indistinguishable um, from, from the original um, what should be done about this should we worry do we not will we do we use it do we both of these but what do we how do we need to it's, contain it's this? not one thing and I wish yeah. I had that I mean I don't think I'd be sitting here uh, quite so um, uh, smugly if I had that one answer I'd be feeling like I need to be executing and doing it right now because it's so important it's a myriad of different things I think it's it's across the piece in a business that both Brad and Tony have mentioned about trying to stay relevant on top of what you're seeing in your business mm -hmm. implementing those policies and trying to see what's coming at you you know to use the example of Twitter we spent a lot of time regardless of your take on what Twitter is now like a company when I joined the board in 2016, there was a massive amount of work going on to try and manage misinformation, which was before the election at that point and, and so on. And Of course, when they say misinformation, they mean things that they disagree with or people who call out what they're doing. That's what, when they say misinformation, they're actually talking about most of you. You know, that shifted in technical ability, but also what was coming at us just in that period of time. And it shifted again dramatically, clearly in the last year again. So. I wish I could give you a silver bullet answer. I can't. I think that we have, it has to be a joined up approach between companies thinking about it, government. There will be regulation, of course. There's some coming in our online harms bill. I'm dubious about how effective that's going to be. It's already legislation from the past, not for the future. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly kind of the point we're talking about. That legislation is a brilliant example of something starts, you know, don't let's harm children on the internet. Fairly uncontroversial. You'd have thought we could get around that quickly. And it's morphed into this massive piece of legislation that is practically uh, you know, hard, hard to get redress as a citizen and hard to deal with as a company. No one's being bad in that scenario. Everyone wanted to do the right thing, but it's become slightly unmanageable. And so that's the complexity, I think. Mm, and that's a really, really good example of how, just how hard, even with the best will in the world, legislation and legislators find it to keep up with this. Brian, you've given this a great deal of thought uh, in your writing in Microsoft. The first thing I would say is I think this is very important, and I think it's especially important for the UK and the US since we'll both have elections in 2024. I think we should start by recognizing that we uh, need to address especially what we call foreign cyber influence operations, namely efforts by the Russians, the Chinese, or the Iranians to try to disrupt public opinion and impact in a, the, the sway of an election. Disrupt public opinion by getting them to agree with things that we disagree with, is what he means. And we should recognize, in my view, that whereas we've largely been able to defeat the Russians with traditional cyber attacks in a place like Ukraine, the Russians without AI are very, very good in this space. They probably spend about a billion dollars a year. They have a complete ecosystem. They pump out the information in 23 languages. And we've probably built what I think today is the best capability in the world to track this. AI will make them better. Now, they don't actually need to be able to get that much better to continue to be successful. And it's really important to remember that. So project number one, between now and 2024, Let's make it hard for them to use AI to get better. And I think we'll see an initiative emerge quickly that fundamentally will involve watermarking and controls so that when they're using technology from companies to say create synthetic audio or video, you know, it gets watermarked so people know that it's been created synthetically. I think that we can use watermarking to make it harder for them. Now that's very interesting what he's talking about here. So if a meme or something comes from one of these so-called like Russian or Chinese or Iranian or, you know, some of these kind of disruptive forces that they're claiming, it will have a watermark on it so that let's say you post it or you retweet it, it will still have that watermark. Is that how it works? This is, this is kind of very interesting uh, level of surveillance that, Microsoft are in charge of here. Were you aware of that? Were you aware that they were doing this? Because that 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 means there'll be a bit of digital metadata on that on that thing that they can track, whether it's on Twitter or on Telegram or on Facebook or whatever. If it carries that watermark, they'll be able to to trace its journey. Very interesting indeed.
Very interesting. ...them to change other, say, video content using AI or other technology. Project number two, which I really regard in some ways as the linchpin for everything, is the ability to detect these kinds of activities much more rapidly. And AI should be an enormous help because we have so much data today and what we don't have is enough humans to go through it all, but with the power of AI, we can add to that human capacity and detect what they're doing more quickly. The third thing we need to do, and this in my view is the hardest, is then to figure out how the, we use the knowledge we gain when we detect what they're doing to disrupt it. And that really involves two things. How do we talk about it? How do we issue warnings? Believe me, for a company like Microsoft, the hardest thing is like, how do we use our voice to tell the public what we see? We do that with other forms of cyber attacks. But this is new terrain, and it's not easy terrain to, to sort out. Um, and what do we do, for example, if you're Twitter or, or LinkedIn or, or Facebook or some other platform, and we see content that has been altered with, say, the intent to deceive? I think we would benefit if governments would revise laws that in certain instances would make that an unlawful act, but we'll have to decide. Do we take it down? Do we make it harder to find in a search index? Do we relabel it so that it is what we know it to be? This is, this is pretty interesting, guys. Very interesting indeed. ...altered content. And we do need to sort this out, I will say, by the beginning of the year, if we are going to protect our elections in 2024. Thank you for that and for reminding us that actually these, these, these questions are coming right up at us uh, as elections keep doing. But, um, but you, you, the impact is, is really just you know, months away, in a sense. I want to ask you all, before we go to general questions... And I I, I, I'll just mention, by the way, that my brother you know his two big claims one he said they're going to ramp up on alien stuff um as a kind of last port of call to justify global government he said that for many many years but his other one is that they're going to keep on running with cyber attack narratives that the next big thing is going to be cyber and they're going to use that as a kind of pretext to control discourse on the internet more and more basically what the microsoft guy just said and they've got the next election 2024 next year in mind so given what we're seeing here i expect to see some monitoring and surveillance like we've never seen before uh in in, in, the, in the next six six to twelve months and i don't know how they're gonna go about doing it if it's going to be the mass bannings like we've seen in the past or there's going to be some other way of doing it because that that watermark tracing thing um he talked about how do we alert the public on that well do you remember how he used to get all the fact checks and stuff during the trump era i'm wondering if there's gonna if the governments are gonna start launching a website where they were like oh this is fake this is fake here's the watermark here's the watermark etc um that will be very interesting uh, I, I expect to see high-profile examples of this coming up, given what they're talking about right now. I know there are going to be a lot. There's a lot online as well. Do keep them coming. Do you think we should create a new agency to regulate this? Uh, and my colleagues at Chatham House will know I'm no fan of going around creating hypothetical new agencies. But And I can tell already from a lot of the questions that that is the way people are thinking. Some people talk about a new International Atomic Energy Agency, like the, the nuclear watchdog, for this stuff. And I would like to know where your instincts are. Uh, maybe no more than that at this point. Martha. I think I would say yes. I think that the capacity to change kind of institutional knowledge and skills at speed is a pretty big ask from where we sit right now. And maybe by being able to inject an enormous energy around joining up the civil society, academic, corporate world together and quickly is most likely if we are creating a new structure. But then maybe it might not need to live forever. It could be a five-year process to then put skills back into... Where have I heard that before? If they set this up, it will never be shut down. Yeah, we're going to set up a new uh, a new regulatory body that only exists for five years. No, it will exist forever. 
uh, countries and departments. It can't be the only thing that happens, but I think it might be one of the things that's necessary. Tony. Yeah, I agree. Um, I just subject to getting really good people to run them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, that, that is a big line of discussion. How, 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 the, the world's, the world's uh, technocrats who uh, can manage these things are in short supply, Brad. Who do we hire? Has to be my guys. Get my guys in there. That's what he's saying, really. Yeah, I, would, I agree. I mean, we won't need an agency to regulate every aspect of everything, which is probably a good thing. Um, but I do think that there are certain uses of AI, certain foundational models, and certain applications in critical areas, including, say, using AI to control critical infrastructure, where we should probably want a licensing regime. And we should probably want it at a national level, and we should probably want an international agency licensing as well. Of, and I'm just looking at a, a question. It's from actually... Um, do you have a license for that, AI, mate? You're going to have chat GDP licenses now. <laughs> As, as dreamt up by Microsoft. Basically, we can have one and you can't. Mitchell here, uh, no, sorry, it's, it's from someone that was asking, should people be licensed? Are you talking about companies, people? I'm talking about companies, right. not, not people. Mm. Look, the only test I failed in my life was when I moved here in 1989 and failed the driver's test. <laughs> <laughs> I was told to feed the wheel, and as an American, I didn't even know it was hungry. Um, so <laughs> let's leave the individuals alone for a while. Yeah. Let's get the companies under control and figure out what kind of system we need to protect safety. But I do think we're going to want to do So he wants the companies, he wants the companies licensed. That basically means that Microsoft get a license and your little company doesn't. That's basically what this is going to mean. You're not going to, they're not going to let any old Tom, Dick and Harry play with this. It's just going to be the big boys. Do this on an international basis as quickly as we can. Because what we're fundamentally talking about, especially if licensing goes to say the processes used to develop safety. Imagine 10 different countries saying that the safety process and product development each needs to be different. It's just, it's not just that it slows innovation. In my experience, it creates the risk of errors when you have people tripping over each other. So I think we're going to have real pressure for international harmonization very quickly. Okay, thank you for that. And I, your phrase, let's get the companies under control, is a striking one from the president of a, a, a leading company. Um, let's go to questions. <laughs> we're going to be, oh, oh. Loads and loads and loads. Okay. Mental. It's mental. Brilliant. Um, I'm sport for choice, right? Here on the aisle and then here. I'm going to take them in pairs. Here on the aisle. Uh, back. Yep. And then uh, here on the aisle. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. So my question is... Oh, um, would you like to say who you are? You don't have to, but we'd love to know. Uh, my name is Timothy fuller me. I am a lawyer at Michigan Dorea. Um, my question is... Obviously, AI, AI is here. It's Tone's thinking, how did this dude get in the room? What, what the hell Chatham House come into? It wasn't like this a few years ago. Impact in everybody's lives. How can we, from in terms of education, how can we help children and young people sort of understand AI and how it works? Because, because of the impact it's going to have on job, job opportunities on certain industries, what can we do from an educational standpoint to ensure that they are equipped to navigate this sort of future AI that we are already in. Thank you. Here on the aisle. Uh, hi, my name is Elizabeth Seeger from the <coughs> Center for the Governance of AI. Um, and this goes back to a comment that was made about the Global AI Summit, um, specifically that out of the summit, the world needs a new paradigm for thinking about and managing AI safety. I was wondering if you could expand on, on that paradigm shift. What do you see as our current paradigm? And ideally, what paradigm should, be, should we be switching into? Okay, thank you very much, and thanks for pressing on. This is a subject riddled with um, abstractions and metaphors. Uh, thank you for pressing on that. And I'm going to add a third one online from Dina Mufti saying which jobs will be in, uh, displaced in the UK and which jobs will be needed to bring us down to the core of it. Who would like to start? You don't have to answer. You don't have. You don't have to answer all of it. But I've got to. Right. We've got young people and how they're going to understand it. New paradigm and UK jobs. Um, so I think in education, actually, AI has got a lot of applications in education itself. Uh, and I was talking uh, a couple of days ago to someone who will speak at our 
the conference we're having in a few weeks' time. Uh, Sal Khan, who runs this Khan Academy that does uh, um, extraordinary work on, on, on creating programs for young people. And actually, the way that we teach will also be hugely affected by this. And that will be one of the ways, by the way, which young people um, learn ab about the technology and about its possibilities. But I think in the end, we will probably reform the way we, we, we educate and the curriculum and everything about it. So I, I think this is going to be, this is why I think it's, it's when I talk about a reimagining of this. Tell you what, Spangler talks about Faustian man. This guy is just possessed with the spirit of Faustianism. I mean, he is like, he has always been like this. He loves the idea of transformative tech. I mean, it doesn't have to go that way. They don't have to embrace this. You could just carry on teaching with traditional teachers if you wanted to. But no, they want they want to transform education by by replacing all the teachers with bloody robots. State and public services, I really mean that. I think it will be, it, it, you know, we'll have to alter everything that we, we do in order to take advantage of it and in order, obviously, to, 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 as I said earlier, to mitigate the risks. But I think, you know, making sure that young people are then growing up with the skills they require, the risk is that you end up with a deep divide, that all the inequalities of society get, get deepened. And this is why the public policy of that aspect of this is really important. But I don't think you can engage in the public policy properly unless you actually understand it. And the only thing I'd say is that people better qualify, um, particularly on the, the, what we should get out of this AI summit. But I think we're, I think we'll be lucky to get a new paradigm out of the summit at the end of this year. What I hope we will get is an exposing of the political class to the full magnitude of this challenge. And if we get that as a first step, I think we'll be doing pretty well. And also, the, the, the getting young people to understand is it, it, so that's trumped by getting politicians to understand, you know, almost. Well, well I mean, the young people, a lot yeah. of them, will, by the way, will take to this. Hmm. I mean, as we all know, we've got, got kids or grandchildren. I mean, they'll take to it pretty fast. <laughs> Martha. Just two points. I'm really struck by how there was this huge push to put coding into the curriculum, based again from a good, probably good genesis that children should be well equipped in the digital world. How completely misplaced, in my opinion. Completely irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant, and very quickly. Not, you know, and I maybe say that as someone that kept a book of Java programming on her desk to scare the tech team. I can't code at all in her company. Um, <laughs> but I, the, the serious point is that so quickly the skills are not going to be the technical skills that we're embedding in the system now. They're going to be either the intervention, and Brad is far better placed to talk about that than me, or the human skills that we're always going the to need. Skills. The creative skills. The yeah. curiosity. You know, you will always be okay if you keep asking questions and work really hard. So, so that whole learn to code thing already outdated according to this woman sort of more the philosophy I, I believe so i think it's dangerous to try and design around any one bit of technology when the technology is moving so quickly mm. just to quickly talk about british business because of mm. president of british chambers of commerce hundred thousand members around the world 80 percent of our members right now say that skills and people are their biggest concern their biggest concern we have a million unfilled jobs in this country and people can't get the people they need they can't find them they can't retain them they can't retrain them so it's all across the piece so let's replace them with robots let's replace them with ai yeah that will fill up the the jobs i mean there could be good things that come out of this suddenly you don't need like to pour in millions of immigrants because you can just get robots to do it how about that I haven't heard that mentioned, but that's the way I would think about it. So arguably you could say maybe this is an exciting new world where we will be able to fill more jobs and we will have the capacity to do more things. But I think it's probably naive not to put that against a backdrop of a rapidly shifting sands. And I think the thing that matters is making sure that we don't create this two-tier economy and that we can equip businesses to understand more of this stuff, to be able to invest in it wisely, to be able to have the regulation that helps them to make the right... But you are going to create this two-tier economy, aren't you? Because you're basically talking about creating mass unemployment from what you, everything you've said in the past hour. So I, I just don't see how they're... They haven't actually 
suggested a single tangible thing for how they're going to mitigate that. You know, if, if Joseph Schumpeter would would be here, he'd be he'd be uh, jumping up and down, saying like, you know, this is going to be creative destruction by the power of ten, by the sounds of things. Right decision. So it's really fundamental that we help British businesses navigate this landscape, which comes back to partly, I would argue, something we want out of this summit. Yeah, and Brett, mm. just for you, can I just uh, mm. literally ask you this in the, that third question? Because I think a lot of people think, OK, when you have these technology revolutions, people get displaced, but then new jobs come along and the one equals the other. Are we in that scenario or not? Uh, we're, we're absolutely in that scenario, in my view. And I, when we wrote our book in 2019, we actually had this in one of the chapters about AI. We said, what's a, what's a job that's going to be eliminated? I said, the job of taking orders at a fast food restaurant which actually you now read in the news, that that is exactly what's happening. But think about it for a minute. How little real value is added by human beings? I listen to you tell me what you want. I punch it on a keypad. You look at it, and then you give me your credit card. <laughs> the case for eliminating the McDonald's minion, ladies and gentlemen, because they add no value. <laughs> and is he right? I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask people in the chat. Press one if you think he's right that the McDonald's minion adds no value, and press two if you think he's wrong. Not really doing that much. That it, it's not the worst thing in the world if those are the jobs that go away. Let's use people to do better things that will be more fulfilling. But then there are jobs that exist in 2023 that literally no one had ever heard of a year ago. It's called being a prompt engineer. What's a prompt engineer? It's somebody that works with one of these generative AI systems, GPT-4, ChatGPT, others. And they're basically, they're learning how to use this system to do whatever their employer wants it to do. And there's a real art and science and skill set that is being developed to do that. And just a prompt engineer, somebody who just t types stuff into chat GDP. Are you kidding me? Did I hear him right? What, what fucking value does that add? A prompt engineer. <laughs> I mean, that's even more useless than the McDonald's Minion, isn't it? What's, what's the possible purpose of him? Just as we saw employers really increase investment in employee training in the 90s when PCs entered the workplace, we're going to see this not just in schools and, and, and universities, it's going to be businesses and governments. I think we're going to need to invest more in this. I mean, you're talking about creating mass unemployment. How many possible people can be prompt engineers? I mean, if if what Blair was talking about comes to fruition, that's millions and millions of teachers out of a job. What, they're all going to become prompt engineers? Kind of new skill. If I just go to the other question, though, what's the new paradigm? What I keep trying to think about in part is, what's the existing para paradigm that might be the most helpful, the most thought-provoking, the most relevant? And, you know, Sam Altman and has said, and I've... You know, I had a number of conversations with uh, him about this. You know, he suggested the Inter International Atomic e uh, Energy Agency. And I think that's interesting, but I I'm sort of myself coming to uh, the International Civil Aviation Organization. Since 1944, it's been a UN agency. It's headquartered in Montreal. But it goes back to the fundamental safety process used to create aircraft, and we have complete interoperability with 192 countries, so you can get on a plane and go from one country to another. Um, but I, I think that the question that you asked is ripe for a lot of good thought, including by academics and research and social science research and the like. Um, but let's not assume that this is so different that we can't learn from some things that we already have. Okay, thank you for that. Let's take some more. Uh... I mean, if, I, if my job was at risk, I would not be uh that this would not be kind of allaying any of my fears at all that they're, they're talking about creating millions and millions and millions of unemployed people and as far as i can see this does not create any new jobs at all oh yeah prompt engineer 
you know, at most that will be a couple of hundred thousand people, if that. It, I, I don't know. If what they're saying actually comes to fruition, you know, I, I can see uh, a lot of trouble on the horizon. Um, and, you know, uh, Scrump and Evelyn have talked about a number of times that their ultimate plan is to stick all these people on UBI. Basically become the flat, the fat blob people uh, that we see in the film wall -E, where you're basically just a consumer. The government pays you to be a consumer and nothing else. And I think a lot of people will take it and be happy as well. That's the darkest part of this. Um, I'm going to go, uh, let's, let's go here on the aisle and then here in the front row. Yeah, hi, uh, Rodrigo Rodriguez Fernandez, International SOS. Uh, given the UK's um, powerhouse status in research and academia, how would you see the UK leveraging uh, this um, to, rather than create, a, um, let's say, a, a new Silicon Valley, we create a new Silicon Bridge between low and middle income countries and high income countries, especially in things uh, like global health uh, equity. Thank you very much. And I'm just noting from June Scott online, I'm not hearing anything regarding non-Western countries. Are we just going to hope they will not develop AI, AI broaden it that way? And here. Uh, thank you. Um, Emma Ross from... Tone's thinking I control all of Africa, don't you know? From ...the Global Health Programme at Chatham House. Um, given what's at stake, I just wondered uh, what your feeling is for the appetite of how interventionist the governance system we can go, um, as far as get ready for what's coming and mitigate it, or more directional, is there an appetite to be a little... To take charge of it a bit more on the front end? Where, where are people thinking, where are you thinking of how interventionist the governance system needs to be for this? Is this a special case or should this be, you know, the norm? Thank you very much indeed for that. Okay. UK powerhouse, um, non-Western countries, how interventionist? Anyone? Martha. Yes, I agree with you about the UK powerhouse. It makes me scream at my radio or scream at my iPad or whatever I'm listening to when I hear politicians say we need to be the next Silicon Valley. I don't want to be the next Silicon Valley in this country. We can bring something more and better to it. We can wreak less havoc on the world and think about it more consequentially. So I agree with you. It links to me directly to your point about the bridge between other countries and how we can show and uh, develop more collaborative and inclusive design. One of the things I feel like with my dereliction of beauty, if I don't mention sitting here, is just about bringing more diverse voices full stop into this landscape. I don't just mean at the summit and bringing... I still have absolutely no clue what this woman does or why she's there or anything, by the way. Uh, she just seemed, but, you know, the globalist class is full of women like this. Academia and the groups of uh, vulnerable people, I mean actually diverse voices, because if you look at who the creators of this stuff is, and where the power is already going very, very fast. It is not in the places, I think, that will unlock the most benefit for the maximum number of humans. And that matters. So I think we need more younger people, more people from different backgrounds, more people from different um, countries, more people from different genders. And that is so fundamental if we're going to get this right. And I think the UK can showcase some of that, build some of it. And when you only say more people from different genders, do you mean just the two genders that there are? Or do you have something else in mind? kind of to my point earlier, one of the things I think should come out of the summit is some actual development of use case, good examples of how things can change and shift to show what's possible. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Brad, do you want to interventionist UK powerhouse, non-Western um, countries? First of all, I think it's very important to be proactive. Second, I think it's good to build on strengths. There is no country that is better positioned than the UK, but we're all sort of starting this race. And if I were to be candid, a lot of what is said in this room today, I've heard said in 17 other countries as well. <laughs> we're the name of powerhouse. So how do you really make yourself successful? And I think it's, you start to do what you suggested. What are our strengths? And in particular, what are the strengths that 
we, where we can use AI to make them even stronger. And you know, from a Microsoft perspective, having been in this country for 40 years as an individual who spent four years living here, the United Kingdom has an extraordinary strength in science, you know, in biology, in you know, chemistry, you know, you know, in physics, you know, in meteorology, all of these enormous things. And it's true in the universities and it's true in the companies. And every one of these fields is going to be transformed by AI. The field of scientific computing is just going to just revolutionize science, I would argue. Make sure you're at the forefront of that and that the government is actually stimulating and providing funding to get off to an early start and make it go faster. And then on the other side, I do... These people are utterly, I mean, utterly insane. This whole conversation has been mental, in my, in my opinion. But... I do think that it is good to lean in on safety and to be proactive interventionist, of course, in a balanced way. You don't want to stifle innovation. But if there's one thing I hear around the world, and I completely actually agree with it, people say, let's not make the same mistake with AI that we did with social media. And then you sort of have a conversation. Let's talk about the mistake we made. I think one of the mistakes we made, and I think we should just say we all made it. We all got too exuberant. In the wake of the Arab Spring, we thought that social media would become the savior of democracy. And instead, in five years, we found that it was a weapon targeting democracy. Let's not go <laughs> into this era with just unbridled exuberance. Let's identify the problems and start to manage them. And then I'll just say one last thing. If there's one thing I've found over the years, I've, I've been at Microsoft for 30 years now, and I've been involved in so many you know, negotiations with governments and companies around the world. Total mask off moment that was. Totally mask off. World. Every time we got something done, a new regulatory agreement or something else, we would sit down at the end and you know, sort of on both sides you look at each other and you'd say, yeah, what is it that we're going to most regret? What's the mistake we made? What is it that's going to go wrong? Five years later, we were always wrong. <laughs> Something usually goes wrong, actually, that's the way life works, but it is so hard to predict it in a fast-moving technology field that one needs agility and humility to keep adapting. Thank you for that. Tony, do you have um, some other? Yeah, just deal with the, the, before coming to the, Britain as a global power on this, but um, on the, on, on how government intervenes, I. I, th I think this, this will be completely different uh, because I think government is going to, it, its, its first task will be to get the right skills into government to be able to understand in order to be able to do anything with this that is meaningful. And secondly, the biggest problem, if we're not careful, is that government tries to change everything uh, without changing itself. Uh, and there's no doubt in my mind that this, this is going and should change the whole way the state operates. So I think that's that's why I say. So I think it's really quite different this because of the, of the nature. The Dark Lord's terrifying dystopian vision here. This is I haven't heard him say this stuff before. What has he got in mind about the complete transformation of the state? Of the revolution, I think in respect of Britain. Yeah, I agree with what. Brad was saying completely about how Britain should position itself and what, what we tried to, William Hague myself set out in the paper, the group of things that we need to do in order to give us the best opportunity. And um, because we do have real strengths, we probably after America and China are, you yeah. know, number three, so that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, but he is 100% right about, <laughs> everyone's on this. <laughs> You go to Paris, Macron's talking about it. You go to Germany, Schultz is talking about it. Now, you go to Africa, they're starting to talk about it. And here's what's going to be interesting. I think there are things that we can do as this technology develops where we can have relationships with countries the blades, the blades. where we're helping them make their changes and reforms using this technology. And I think that can be very significant. So one of the things, I mean, we work now in almost 40 different countries around the world, most of them developing. And 
with the teams of people that are there on the ground, I'm constantly saying to the leaders, don't try and repeat the legacy systems of the West in health and education. Or, or even in basic things like your interaction with the citizen. You can do it completely differently through technology. That's why we try to get them to adopt proper data infrastructure. You can cut the citizen out entirely. <laughs> you know, move their data into the cloud, have it so that it can, it can help them, for example, predict healthcare issues and so on in a much, much better way. But the other thing that's going to be interesting is that because a lot of this will be open to people, a lot of countries, if they create, if they watch carefully this regulatory debate and create the right regulatory framework within their countries, there's no reason why they shouldn't also become players in this, in this space. Because in the end, for example, if you take the way the, I think the pharmaceutical industry is one of those industries that's going to be hugely disrupted as a result of this, and the clinical research organizations, I think, even more so. But I'm looking at some of the countries we're working with today who are going to change completely the way that they collect the data in respect of their citizens, the way they use it. Some of them are now going to the pharmaceutical companies for the first time and saying, we can provide you a much better way of doing trials. You know, you, there's no point in doing trials in a whole lot of Western countries. Actually, Britain is a good place uh, to do trials because of the ethnic diversity of our population. But, you know, some of these countries themselves are going to sit down and work out how they can play a role in this, and then, and we should be helping them be partners in that. So it, it requires a, an understanding that I think, it, you know, you're either going to get your, get to grips with this, or you're going to get left behind. And one of the things we do in the Institute, I say to people today, the difference between countries that succeed and fail today, because everything is in the end pretty open and mobile. The thing that's not mobile is your government. Right? If your government's useless, not much chance. Right? Your government takes some good decisions. Our government's useless, Tone. Decisions, you can put yourself on a, a track for the future. And I think that will be a really interesting part of all this. And by the way, at the G20 this year, you'll find what India decides to center on is what its technology could do for the global south. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's a big that new world geopolitically, too. That is a hugely important last point. We are going to have to end there. I'm really sorry. There's a forest of hands up. There are some terrific questions online. Let me just say, online, there's been a whole cluster around threats, which we've dealt with as much as we can in this, this short space of time. There's an interesting um, lot on who guards the guards. Philip Thomsey, thank you for your beautifully phrased question on that. Uh, we've dealt with that briefly with the agency, but much, much more could be discussed on that. Ah, oh, yeah, the agency. Yeah, the, yeah. You can trust the agency to guard the guards, because the Mafia is going to investigate the Mafia, as always. Um, and there is a, a final strand on, um, is this really an existential threat to humanity? Going back to the first question I asked the trio yes. about... Yes, it uh, is. <laughs> ..how big is that? And we've, we've, um, uh, we've answered that, I think, as best we can in the time. So, thank you. No, you haven't. You've basically said, yes, it is a massive threat, but... Let's fucking embrace it 100%. Like, let's go forward 200 miles an hour and really, really kind of go all in on this, even though it seems like it's going to mess everything up. That's basically what I heard for the past hour. These people are insane. All enormously for coming and thank the three of you very much indeed for setting out your ideas. That was mental. That was completely mental. You see, this is this is the bit of uh, this is the bit of Blair that I've never aligned with. Is is, and I talk about this in Prophets of Doom, which starts with uh, Blair talking about progress. Is their kind of insane Faustian kind of worship of future tech, um, and you know, going go, like going in two footed into this, um, even though I can, they all say it's going to create massive destruction disruption and destruction of existing industries and jobs and yet i saw no basic plan at all about how to deal with any of those things in that entire discussion and yet they were all like yeah let's just go full steam ahead with it and create an agency because that's gonna that's gonna work fucking mental absolutely mental um uh, i have got entropy open but it's not working has anybody tried to send uh, an entropy? Uh, I am still seeing the same 
messages from the White Knight and the messages that I got yesterday on Unpopular Opinions are no longer showing up. So if any has anybody sent an entropy? I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I'm not seeing anything. So apologies uh, for that. Um, if you did send any, I'll try to pick them up at a later date if they show up. But they're not. I'm seeing like last week's one from the White Knight a hundred times again, um, and I am not seeing the ones from last night. So, uh, all right. Let me just go through. Let, let me just go through. Uh, the super chats. Um, an original username says, "After your last Blair stream, I really want David Blunkett back in power." Yeah, David Blunkett, I think is. Ba I mean, is basically based in my view. I have been. Um, somebody has been sending me uh, stuff Blunkett has said since, and I. I really do think he's one of the uh, one of the old good guys. Um, in a way, uh, blanket. Ratbags Anonymous says, Hi AA, I am paying you again to rename this series The Blair Watch Project. It would mean so much. Uh, I mean, Dark Lord Watch though. I mean, yeah, I do, I do, I do see that Blair Watch Project is an equally good title. Um, Blue Wizrobe says, Tony B-L-A-I-R, have we forgotten what you are? Travelling across the seas to help screw all the other countries. God damn the forsaken Tony Blair. Uh, Alex Knight says, when is the next Shieldings event? Um, you'll have to check with the Shieldings guys about that. But I think it's in August. I think it's the at the end of August. Um, I, uh, I, am not, I am not speaking at that event. I may, I may go as a punter, possibly, but uh, I'm, not, um, I'm not on the card. Um, Maximus Lollius says... Where does Blair go on Shadow Chancellor if he controls Starmer? Not sure Rachel Reeves is his woman. Um, well, there was talk about uh, Blair becoming a lord that was in the news the other day. If Keir Starmer makes Tony Blair a lord, he could then re-enter the cabinet. I think that Starmer has a problem, though, which is that um, Blair is a threat to his authority and power within the party. Because if everybody knows that Blair is really the boss and Starmer is, like, if Blair's the Emperor and Starmer's the Darth Vader, for example, well, everybody's like, well, Keir Starmer's not really the boss. Um, and I think that may end up being a problem. Power can't brook a rival, right? So at the moment, it's clear that Starmer's taking instructions from Blair but how long can that realistically continue uh, in, in the way that it has so far? Um, you can't really have a backseat a back a back driver head of the party. Starmer, if, he, if Starmer's the boss, he's going to have to show he's the boss. And at the moment, I think he's looking a lot like Blair's puppet. Uh, which is, you know, I'm just saying it's a, it's a weak position for Starmer. Um so if Blair comes into the actual cabinet as a lord, I mean, the centre of the room is always going to be Blair. I mean, imagine you were in a room with Starmer there and Blair's there. Everybody's going to look at Blair as the boss. So uh, there, I, I don't know. There, there, there could be... Starmer may be thinking, I may have to keep Tony at arm's length here because, you know, I'm the leader, not, not, not Blair. So, so I do think that is going to be a problem for New Labour 2.0 going forward. Um, because I think the mainstream media is starting to notice what we've all noticed. I've seen more and more articles about the influence of Blair behind the scenes and so on and so forth. Um, you know, in, in mainstream newspapers now and places like Unheard and, you know, things that are a bit adjacent to this channel, for example... Everybody started to know, notice the influence of Tone. Um, and that could become a political issue for Starmer, in which case he may have to distance himself from Tony. I'm just saying, like, these are realistic things that could happen. Uh, Lady of Shalott says, Tone was a good barrister. He knows how to argue. Yep, master of rhetoric, as we as we saw at the start of the stream. Blue Wizrobe says, despite my previous years, 
I do think you have a point about Blair being a better alternative to the Tories. Also, I'm an American, so I don't really have a dog in this fight anyway. I mean, Blair is a lot more skilled than any of the politicians currently in, in politics. Um, but it's not without its dangers, you know. I mean, this, this stream, I thought they were meant... I, I thought everybody on this um, panel went in their attitude to AI was just insane. Um, that's just my view, though. But Blair would probably say, well, I'm a reactionary and he's a, he's a progressive. So you've got to remember that it's not like... I've tried to explain this before. These kind of technocratic globalists are less into the the woke stuff, although there was a bit of diversity bollocks on this stream. Um, they're less into the woke stuff, and they're more into their kind of kind of dystopian kind of technology future stuff, uh, which has climate change baked into the pie as well. Um, I don't see them being immovable on that at all. Um, so, you know, when, I mean, my prediction is that the woke will be put away, uh, other opinions are available, but no matter what happens, I don't see them being movable on the tech piece and on the climate change piece at all. Um, although interestingly, Keir Starmer did announce that if, if, um, the Labour came to power, they, they are not doing all of the, they're not doing the stop oil stuff. They've actually ruled it out. They're like, we just can't do it. Um, so, I mean, there's not a lot to be optimistic about. Let's be honest, okay? I don't want to be too black-pilled. We're between a rock and a hard place. The Tories are bloody useless. This lot, at the very least, okay, on, on the one hand, they're kind of mental, uh, as we've seen on, the, on, this, on this show tonight. But on the other hand... Their pragmatism is is at least a constraint, right? So, for example, they will have sat down and be like, look, if we do this plan where we stop using North Sea oil, we're not going to be able to run the country. There's not going to be enough electricity. We're just not going to be able to be like, we're not be able to run anything. So, of course, they were going to drop those plans. Right, because they're not like, you know, at the end of the day, these people are, people are kind of pragmatic technocrats uh in a sense um you know not pragmatic enough for me otherwise they wouldn't be jumping headlong into these sort of technologies that we're talking about but you know that's one thing that i think is a fair bet that they'll pay you know they won't drop the climate stuff but when push comes to shove they're not going to allow the economy to come screeching to a halt over some ideological matter like north sea oil for example and uh that was just this past week that was just a couple of days ago that starmer said that so um and and that's something that the tories have been bad on by the way is is the, is the green stuff they've been very bad on the green stuff uh they've jumped into every single little thing um so yeah and that that's actually in my i mean this is a bit of a conspiracy theory but I think that's why they got rid of Liz Truss. I think Liz Truss is basically an uh, is backed by the oil donors. She's 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 big energy, right? And um, Sunak, if you notice, undid all of the energy stuff as soon as he came in. So that is something that uh, I think has happened within the Tory Party. That's why they got rid of Truss. Um, uh, Lady of Shalott says I watched Tomorrow's World as a child they promised me a feature with flying cars and scientific genius they never mentioned this panel of trolls <laughs> I, mean, I mean more and more the future sounds dystopian doesn't it um, which uh, I really hope it doesn't turn out like that because I've got a three year old daughter and you know the, the feature they were describing sounds fucking grim it really does so all we can do is hope that it doesn't turn out like that. Cringe Walker says, would you consider an AI conference for Cigar Stream? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't mind having people on who know a bit about, about AI to talk about it. I have to admit, I don't have the technical knowledge or expertise to speak to it myself beyond some of the political implications. 
Um, I mean, I'm fascinated by the amount of people who say it doesn't exist, right? It doesn't exist at all. Um, a lot of people throughout this thing are saying, like, this is all rubbish because AI is not real. Um, I find it mad, though. That, like, how is all this... If AI is not real, what the hell were they talking about then? You know? Um, I mean, to me, when I hear them planning basically mass unemployment to be, you know, re replace millions of people uh, with with their AI, and then the only the only new jobs created are prompt engineers, that's got alarm bells ringing. You know, if you read Joseph Schumpeter and Creative Destruction, he was aware of this. Joseph Joseph Schumpeter, in his fantastic uh, book that the name is, escapes me now, he basically he basically predicted that this was the Achilles heel heel of capitalism and why capitalism was doomed to failure in the long run because it w the creative destruction creates so much short term mass unemployment that people won't be able to be retrained uh, quick enough and it will create a social disruption. Now that has happened historically. There's been a lot of mass dislocations in the past hundred years, but they haven't been at the sk uh, big enough, and new jobs have been created enough so that Schumpeter's prediction didn't happen. But listening to these guys, if if it's even a fraction of what they're talking about, I maybe Schumpeter's prediction will come true because I I just don't see how the system survives uh, that many unemployed. I mean. Just, just teachers alone. I mean, I, there are millions of teachers, millions of teachers. If you're going to start replacing them with AI, what, what do they all do? They can't all become prompt engineers. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I may sound like an old-fashioned kind of reactionary on, on this, but I just don't see the, where the new jobs are coming from. And I was not reassured by the dude from Microsoft when he, when he, when he said it. So... I think those fears are justified at this moment, you know. Um, anyway, uh, I'll, I'll carry on. Uh, but yeah, I would consider doing a panel on AI if any people are really into this. Um, it'll probably be one of those where I'm just the host and I ask questions and things because it's something I don't really understand as a tech myself. And I don't. I also don't understand those people who say it's not real because if it's not real, what, what what's the chat? What are the stuff that you show me, Cringe Walker? Or what's the um, what's the chat GDP and all that? Anyway, Bobali says maybe get the authors of the article on the show. Um, I mean maybe, but if they're kind of Russian state, if they're employees of the Russian state in the current political climate, that's a little bit uh, of a risk, I would say. Anything to do with Russia at the moment is heavily monitored. Um, and uh, I, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I'd guess that I am an individual as an individual am heavily monitored by the UK government. You know, I could be being paranoid, but I don't think so. Um, ben Davis, I mean, pr I'm probably monitored by Blair himself. <laughs> uh, ben Davis says Tony Blair, evil genius or useful idiot. Um, I mean, I. I, I do think he's an evil genius. I do think that he understands power and understands organization and um, uh, is very effective at doing those things. Uh, the question is, if he's a useful idiot, who's he a useless idiot for? He's certainly very good at making himself rich, tell you that much. Um, but I don't, th I mean, I some of the stuff he was talking about tonight was straight out of the Klaus, uh, the Klaus Schwab, Fourth Industrial Revolution. That was the kind of language he was using tonight. Um, it seems to me that he, uh, the Microsoft dude, guys like Bill Gates, who's a heavy backer of Blair, Blair himself, um, World Economic Forum, Davos guys, they all have their eye on 10, 20 years and trying to shape that now. And they, they keep on talking about this fourth industrial revolution or these kind of massively dis disruptive changes that, that, that are coming down the pike. Um, what concerns me is that I'm not I'm not very reassured by their answers to those questions, because it's, it seems like, you know, they're very aware of, of the risk of creating this massive inequality between people who are basically on top of this stuff and people who are going to get 
screwed over by it. But from what I got from what they were suggesting on this stream that we watched tonight, I think that they're basically going to create that completely stratified society, which is, you know, it's 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 going to be like a return to serfdom. And so what do you do with these millions of possibly even billions of people who are got no useful skills? They, you know, they've got no jobs to go to. And it's going to be the, the, the future of the UBI, where they've got a, this tight elite at the top who control things, um, who have jobs and, you know, uh, get to enjoy their, their lives. And then, then you know, you've got, um, you've got people who have no useful skills living on UBI in their 15-minute cities. That, that is something that, um, you know, if this is going to happen as individuals, like, and as a father... Uh, as well you're gonna have to be thinking well how can we prepare for that world and make sure that we are not living in that in in as one of those ubi serfs that's i mean it, really if this is going to happen that's how we all have to be thinking um because i i mean i i just don't see any prospect of overthrowing them at all um and i mean correct me if i'm wrong i just don't see that happening um and so if this is going to happen, what can we do to future-proof ourselves as a community and as people who are aware of this sort of stuff? Hope this, I mean, I hope that's not too blackpilling, but genuinely the sorts of things that we have to think about. Narco Republican says they are not insane. They are true believers. It is not just cynical power, as you say. They are in it for the transformation of the world. Yeah, yeah. The, the the question is though the transfer the, the 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 transformation of the world to what end? It seems to me that this is just worship of technology for its own sake, and the consequences of what they've talked about tonight are catastrophic for millions of people, and they just don't seem to care about that. I mean, they they say, oh yeah, we're aware of the risks, but I actually thought the Microsoft guy in particular was very blasé about that, very blasé about it. And they were like, oh, yeah, we'll create a new agency to have oversight, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's not going to be much comfort to the bloke who's lost his job or the, you know, or the millions of teachers who are going to be out of work. So, I mean, there is a possibility that this lot will lose power if the disruptions that are coming down the pike are at the levels that Joseph Schumpeter would have predicted. If that happens then there will be revolutionary change around the world. Um, and it's possible that messing with um, lobby groups as powerful as the teachers' union could... And, and you know, the, this is not a small group of people. They're, they're organised as well. Uh, going to war with the teachers and so on could, you know, create other sorts of scenarios unforeseen by us now um but then you know if it's a teacher's revolution do you want to live in that world either i mean that's probably going to be even worse so i have no i have no easy answers friends when it comes to this sort of stuff uh machiavelli sucks to go says i don't want their vision they need to ask us they're not going to ask you though that's that's the truth they're not at no point in that entire discussion did they ever say we need to consult the public? The Microsoft guy paid lip service to, you know, we have to consider our consumers. But at no point did he say there has to be input from this from Joe Public at all. Just not in their thinking. So anyway, this was a pretty depressing stream. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, but, you know, it is where it is. Uh, I can't see anything on entropy. That is it for the super chats. Um, yeah, it was all a bit eat, eat, eat the, the bugs, I'm afraid. But uh, I mean, there are other possibilities, which is that the people in the chat saying that all of this stuff is guff uh, are right, okay, um, and that uh, you know all of this is just all hot air. I don't get the impression it is, though. I really don't get the impression it is. Ah, oh, bloody hell. Let's try to cheer ourselves up. Where, where, where's my... Uh... Tony Villarreal We haven't forgotten who you are Travelling 
traveling across the seas to help save all the other countries. But the day you left, the country fell to its knees. So I say, Tony Blair, T Man, B L A I R, you're in our hearts. I know you had to go. It doesn't stop it hurting. So I say, Tony Blair, with your gentle face. Your heart of gold and strength of God. The day you left this place, the country went to the dogs. But I know you're only one man in the world that needs fixing. If I could, I'd gather all your friends. Together we'd all pitch in. And when the world was fixed, we'd gather round the people in their millions. And we'd raise the crown to the new king. Save our gracious Tony Blair Long live our noble Tony Blair God save our gracious Tony Blair Long live